Good afternoon, friends. Welcome back to Christmas Stories with Macy and Wes. We are on day number six, book number six. So let's open it up and see what we're reading together today. You ready, Wes? Do you need both hands? Grab, grab, grab. There we go. All right. This is a good one. We read this one last Christmas. It's a little bit long. So buckle up and get ready. It is called The Worker in Sandalwood, A Christmas Eve Miracle by Marjorie Pickenhall and Frances Tyrell. Are you ready? Let's get reading. I like to think of this as a true story, but you who read may please yourselves citing either with the curé who says Hyacinth dreamed it all and did the carving himself in his sleep, or with Madame. I am sure that Hyacinth thinks it's true, and so does Madame, but then she has the cabinet with the little birds and the li lilies carved at the corners. Monsieur le Curé shrugs his patient shoulders, but then he is tainted with the infidelities of cities, good man, having been three times to Montreal and once in an electric car to St. Anne. He and Madame still talk it over when they meet, though it happened so many years ago, and each leaves the other forever unconvinced. Meanwhile, the dust gathers at the infinite fine lines of the little bird's feathers and, the so and softens the lily stamens where Madame's duster cannot go. The wood aging takes on a golden gleam as of immemorial sunsets, that pale red wood heavy with the scent of the ancient east, the wood that Hyacinth loved. It was the only wood of that kind which had ever been in Terminasian. Peri le Orlandal brought it into the workshop one morning. A small, heavy bundle wrapped in sacking, and then in burlap, and then in fine, soft cloths. He laid it on a pile of shavings, unwrapped it carefully, and a dim sweetness filled the dark shed and hung heavily in the thin winter sunbeams. Pierre Le Auriel rubbed the wood respectfully with his knobby fingers. It is sandalwood, he explained to Hyacinth, pride of knowledge making him expansive, a most precious wood that grows in warm countries. Smell it. It is sweeter than cedar. It is to make a cabinet for the old madame at the big house. Thy great hands shall smooth the wood, boy, and I, Pierre the cabinet maker, shall render it beautiful. Then he went out, locking the door behind him. When he had gone, Hyacinth laid down his plane, blew on his stiff fingers, and shambled slowly over to the wood. He was a great clumsy boy of fourteen, dark faced, slow of speech, dull-eyed, and uncared for. He was clumsy because it was impossible to move gracefully when you are growing very big and fast on quite insufficient food. He was dull-eyed because all eyes met his unlovingly, uncared for, because none knew the beauty of his soul. But his heavy young hands could carve simple things, like flowers and birds and beasts, to perfection, as the curé pointed out. Simon has a tobacco jar co carved with pine cones and squirrels, and the curé has a pipe whose bowl is the blossom of a lady's slipper that I have seen. But again, it was all very long ago. Hyacinth knew that the making of the cabinet would fall to him, as most of the other work did. He touched the strange, sweet wood and at last laid his cheek against it while the fragrance caught his breath. 
How beautiful it is, said Hyacinth, and for a moment his eyes glowed and he was happy. Then the light passed and with bent hand, head he shuffled back to his bench through a foam of white shavings curling almost to his knee. Madame, perhaps, will want the cabinet next week, for it is Christmas, said Hyacinth, and he fell to work harder than ever, though it was so cold in the shed that his breath hung like a silver cloud and steel stung his hands. There was a tiny window to his right, through which, it, when it was clear of frost, one looked on Termasian, and, then, and that was a cheerful and, sight and made one whistle. But to the left, through the chink of the ill-fitting door, there was nothing but the forest, and the road dying away in it, and the trees moving heavily under the snow. Yet from there came all Hyacinth's silent dreams and reluctant fancies, which he sometimes found himself able to tell in wood, not in word. Brandy was good at the Cinque Chateau, and Pierre Le Oriandel gave Hyacinth plenty of direction, but no help further with the cabinet. That is to be finished for Madame on the festival, dullard, he said, cuffing Hyacinth's ears furiously. Finished with prettiness about the corners. Hearst thou dolt? I suffer from a delicacy of constitution and a little feebleness in the legs these days, so I cannot handle the tools. I must leave this work to thee, clumsy. See that it is done properly, and stand up and touch a hand to thy cap when I address thee, you great oaf. Yes, monsieur, said Hyacinth wearily. It is hard when you do all the work to be cuffed into the bargain, and fourteen is not very old. Hyacinth went to work on the cabinet with slow, exquisite skill, but on the eve of Noel, he was still at work and the cabinet not completed. It meant a thrashing from Pierre if the morrow came and found it still unfinished, and Pierre's thrashings were cruel. But it was growing into a thing of perfection under Hyacinth's slow hands, and he would not hurry it. Then work on it all night, and show it to me all completed in the morning, or thy bones shall mourn its I thy idleness, said Pierre with a flicker of his eye. And he shut Hyacinth into the workshop with a smoky lamp, his tools, and the sandalwood cabinet. It was not unusual. The boy had often been left to finish a piece of work overnight while Pierre went off to his brandies. But this was Christmas Eve and Hyacinth. Until even the scent of sandalwood could not make him dream himself warm, and the roof cracked suddenly in the frost, there came upon Hyacinth one of those awful, hopeless despairs that children sometimes know. In all the world, nothing, he said, staring at the dull flame, no place, no heart, no love. Oh, kind God, is there no place or love for me in all the world? I cannot endure to think of Hyacinth, poor lad, shut up, despairing in the workshop of his loneliness, his cold and his hunger on the eve of Christmas. He looked at the chisel in his hand and thought that by a touch of that he might be at peace somewhere not far from God, except it was forbidden. Then he came to tears and sobs great that sickened and defeated him so that he scarcely heard the gentle rattling of the latch. At least, I suppose it came, but it may have been later. The story is all so vague here. I think that Hyacinth must have gone to the door, opening it upon the still woods and the frosty stars, and the lad who stood outside may, must have said something like, I can see you're working late, friend. May I come in? Hyacinth brushed his sleeve across his eyes and opened the door wider with a little nod. Those lonely villages strung along the great river seems, see strange warfares adrift inland from the sea. Hyacinth said to himself that surely this was such a one. Afterward, he told the curé that for a long moment he had been bewildered. Blinking into the stranger's eyes, he lost for a flash the first impression of youth and received one of some incredible age or sadness. But this also passed, and he knew that the wanderer's eyes were quiet, very quiet, 
as he turned within the door, smiling at Hyacinth and shaking some snow from his fur cap. He did not seem more than sixteen or so. It is very cold outside, said the stranger. There's a big oak tree on the edge of the field that has split in the frost and frightened all the little squirrels asleep there. Next year it will make an even better home for them. And see what I found close by. He opened his fingers and showed Hyacinth a little sparrow lying unruffled in his palm. Poor thing, said Hyacinth. Poor thing. Is it dead then? He touched it with a gentle forefinger. No, answered the strange boy. It's not dead. We'll put it here among the shavings not far from the lamp, and it will be well in the morning. He smiled at Hyacinth again, and the shambling lad felt as if the scent of sandalwood had deepened and the lamp flame burned clearer. But the stranger's eyes were only quiet, very quiet. Have you come far? asked Hyacinth. It's a bad season for traveling. A long way, said the wolf, a long, long way. I heard a child cry. There's no child here, answered Hyacinth, shaking his head. Monsieur, Monsieur le Orandel is not fond of children. He says they cost too much money. But if you've come far, you must be cold and hungry, and I have no food or fire. At Cinque Chateau you will find both. The stranger looked at him again with quiet eyes, and Hyacinth Fasti fancied his face was familiar. I'll stay here, he said. You are very late at work, and you are unhappy. Why, as to that, answered Hyacinth, rubbing his cheek and ashamed of his tears, most of us are sad at one time or another, the good God knows. Stay here and welcome, if it pleases you, and you may take a share of my bed, though it is no more than a pile of, blo of balsam boughs and an old blanket in the loft. But I must be at work on this cabinet. For the drawers must be finished, and the handles put on, and these corners carved all by the holy morning, or my wages will be paid with a stick. You have a hard master, put the other boy, if he would pay you with blows upon the feast of Noel. He is hard enough, said Hyacinth, but once he gave me a dinner of sausages, and one summer some melons. If my eyes will stay open, I will finish by morning, but indeed I am sleepy. Stay with me an hour or so, friend, and talk to me of your wanderings so that the time may pass more quickly. I will tell you of the country where I was a child, answered the stranger. And while Hyacinth worked, he told of sunshine and dust, of the shadows of vine leaves on the flat white walls of a house, of rosy doves on the flat roof, of the flowers that came in the spring crimson and blue, and the white cyclalum in the shadow of the rocks, of the olive, the myrtle, and the almond, until Hyacinth's slow fingers ceased working, and his sleepy eyes blinked wonderingly. See what you've done, friend, he said at last. You've told of so many pretty things, and I have done no work for an hour. And now the cabinet shall never be finished, and I shall get a beating. Let me help you, smiled the other boy. I was also raised by a carpenter. At first, Hyacinth would not, fearing the trust of the sweet, special wood out of his own hands, but at length he allowed the stranger to fit one of the little drawers, and so deftly was the work done that Hyacinth pounded his fist on the bench in admiration. You have a pretty knack, he cried. It seemed as if you did not hold the drawer in your hands, but a moment, and hey-ho, it jumped into its place. Let me fit the other little drawers while you rest a while, said the wanderer. So Hyacinth curled among the shavings, and the stranger fell to work upon the little cabinet of sandalwood. Here begins what the curé believes is a dream within a dream. Sometimes I am forced to agree with him, but then I can see as clearly as with old madame's eyes, and with her and Hyacinth I say, I, too, believe. Hyacinth said that as he lay upon the shavings in the sweetness of the sandalwood, he was very tired. He thought of the country where the stranger had been a boy, of the flowers on the hill and the laughing leaves of aspen and poplar, of the gold flowering anise and the golden sun upon dusty roads, and he thought of these until he was warm. All the time, through these pictures, as though a paint, through a painted veil, he was aware of that other boy with quiet eyes, at work upon the cabinet, smoothing, 
fitting, polishing. He does better work than I, thought Hyacinth, but he was not jealous. And again he thought, it's growing towards morning. In a little while I will get up and help him. But he did not, for the dream of warmth and the smell of the sandalwood held him in their sweet drowse. Also he said that he thought the stranger was singing as he worked. For there seemed to be a sense of some music in the shed, though he could not tell whether it came from the boy's lips or the shabby old tools as he used them. The stars are much paler, thought Hyacinth, and soon it will be morn and the corners are not carved yet. I must get up and help this kind one in a little moment. Only I'm so tired. And the music and the sweetness seemed to wrap him and fold him and hold him close, and that he did not move. Hyacinth lay without moving, and behind the forest there shone a pale glow of some indescribable color that was neither green nor blue, while in termination the church bells began to ring. Day will soon be here, thought Hyacinth immovable in the deep dream of his, and with it will come Monsieur Le Oral and his stick. I must get up and help, for even yet the corners are not carved. But he did not get up. Instead, he saw the stranger look at him again, then lay a brown finger lightly upon the four empty corners of the cabinet. And Hyacinth saw the reddish wood ripple and heave, and break as little clouds when the wind goes through the sky, and out of them thrust forth little birds, and after them the lilies, for a moment living, but even while Hyacinth looked growing hard and reddish-brown and settling back into the sweet wood. Then the stranger laid all the tools neatly in order, and opening the door quietly, he went away into the woods. Hyacinth lay still among the shavings for a long time, and then he crept slowly to the door. The sun, not yet risen, set its first beams upon the delicate mist of frost afloat beneath the trees, and so all the world was aflame with splendid gold. Far away down the road, a dim figure seemed to move amid the glory, but the splendor was such that Hyacinth was blinded. His breath came sharply as the glow beat in great waves on the wretched shed, on the foam of shavings, on the cabinet with the little birds and the lilies carved in the corner. Blessed be the Lord, whispered Hyacinth, clasping his slow hands, and the little sparrow came from his nest among the shavings and took wing into the light. The I love this story of a carpenter, a carpenter in need of help who cries out to God on Christmas Eve and someone about his own age who's also a carpenter comes to his rescue. I think that God often shows up in the midst of our everyday life. And we are looking for big, splendid stories, stories like Hyacinth's story of uh, a sandalwood cabinet that magically comes to be, miraculously comes to be. But God comes to us in our everyday life, our normal life, uh, comes to us as people like ourselves. And uh, I want us to look for God, look for Jesus in our everyday lives uh, this Christmas season. Uh, thank you for reading this story with us. And I hope that as you are maybe cutting your real Christmas tree down to size or um, working with wood or branches in whatever way you might be, that you would remember uh, the great carpenter who became our savior. Thank you for reading this story with me and we will see you again tomorrow for another story. Have a great